So welcome uh, and thank you for joining this presentation. During this session, we will be talking about how can we bypass antivirus using this little device. How many of you know about this one, BDSB? Yeah, it's, it's pretty famous. But have you wondered how can we have one, one interaction initial access using it? Basically, even if the client or the target uses antivirus, we can have just single interaction uh, initial access using BDSB. We'll see how we can achieve this during the, um, the presentation. Um, our target antivirus for, for this presentation will be Windows Defender. So to be vendor neutral, we'll use the Windows default antivirus. But firstly, let me ask you, how many of you rely on Windows Defender? <laughs> okay. Uh, another question. How many of you, from those who raised their hands, are confident in this decision? <laughs> okay, <laughs> some of you. So, let's see if I can convince you to switch to a more advanced solution after this, after this presentation, or to an uh, ADR uh, approach. So, let's start. Uh, two words about myself. Um, I'm certified with some certifications. Uh, my main expertise is offensive, as you can see. Uh, I'm founder of the Zero Attack Security, a cybersecurity provider a company, and we are providing uh, offensive security all over the globe, through all the continents, basically, and trainer for some entities, including the Pentagon and speaker to multiple conferences and also part of the AC Council uh, Certified Ethical Hacker Committee, which means that I'm part of the group that creates the, the syllabus for this certification. As a side note, I'm not responsible for the NMAP questions, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, so this was basically the boring part. Let's move to the, to the most interesting part. Uh, what we will be talking um, today about is the following. So, on our agenda, we have uh, an AMSI bypass technique that we'll use to, to actually uh, evade the antivirus. How can we leverage the execution policy in order to run PowerShell scripts on a local and non-administrator user? Uh, how can we develop a payload runner in order to, to have our payload directly into the memory so we'll have a fileless deployment of our little uh, initial access and how to do everything on this, this nasty device. So uh, let's move forward. We have the following scenario. We have Bob. Bob works at, let's say, insurance company. Bob goes to the parking uh, lot to, to smoke a cigarette. Bob founds a little device uh, on the floor and he will pick this device. Once picked, uh, Bob will go to the office and will plug that device into his computer. What happens next is basically the following. An attacker now is connected to Bob's computer. Uh, basically is connected to the organization that Bob is working for, which means that the attacker has initial access to that company. But how this happened, because Bob has Windows Defender enabled, Bob is not an administrator on the, on the workstation, and the company policy says that removable media storage is disallowed. So let's see because the the answer for all of those questions will be during the the presentation basically the the sequence of the the attacks is the following uh, we have the AMSI bypass, which is used to, to trigger the evasion of the antivirus. We have the execution policy bypass, which is used to evade the, um, the policy that says, okay, non-administrative users are not allowed to run uh, malicious scripts or PowerShell scripts on Windows. We have the payload runner in order to have everything in memory and to not leave any artifacts on the system and some post-exploitation uh, techniques. So, the, the AMSI bypass. Uh, how many of you knows about the AMSI? Okay, 
Perfect. So, for those who uh, don't know about the AMSI, basically it is a middleman between the antivirus product that we have on our computer and the, the workstation, the operating system. Basically, once we run a PowerShell script, for example, the AMSI will try to send that PowerShell script to an antivirus engine in order to check for any malicious indicators. So, if we try to cut the AMSI and try to patch it because we can uh, make AMSI return any value that we want to, we may be able to, to bypass even some of the advanced antivirus solutions. But for the purpose of this talk, we will solely uh, rely on Windows Defender to bypass. So, uh, if we take a look over the internal uh, usage of AMSI, it has the AMSI scan buffer function. The AMSI scan buffer is the one uh, responsible for scanning PowerShell scripts. And the function is taken from AMSI.dll library, which is the official library for AMSI. Uh, and now you can, you can assume what we'll do. Basically, we'll manipulate the AMSI scan buffer function to return an arbitrary value in order to pass all the malicious scripts to execute even if they are malicious or non-malicious and we'll play a little bit with the memory uh, at this at this stage so let's get let's get into the technical things here we have uh, the first part of our payload uh, do you do you notice something uh, strange what languages are here there are two programming languages any ideas yes and Yes, and PowerShell. So, we have C-sharp and PowerShell. How can we do them together? So, how can we play with them on a single script? Our main script will be PowerShell. But PowerShell doesn't know about some Windows native API functions. So, in order to call or to modify those Windows native API functions, we need to use C-sharp. How we use C-sharp with PowerShell, we will use the add type for, for PowerShell, basically, in order to, to play with the, with the functions, with the Windows API native functions. And here, as you can see, we have three functions that we, we defined. So we have the getproc address, which is used to, uh, to get the memory, the address uh, within the memory of a specific function. What function do we want to get the address in memory? Sorry? Yes, exactly. The ANSYS scan buffer uh, function that we discussed previously. Uh, from where do we get that memory address? From the AMSI.dll. How can we find the memory address of a function if we don't know the memory address of the library itself? So, we need to define also the load library function, which is used to return the, the memory address of the AMSI.dll library. And then we'll use the virtual protect, which is basically used to patch the memory address uh, within that, uh, that function. Basically, we'll use the virtual protect to, to play with the, uh, with the function, with the AMSI scan buffer function. And the second step here uh, is to load the AMSI.dll into the, into the actual memory. Then we use the get proc address, uh, as we discussed previously, to get the AMSI scan buffer uh, function address within the memory. And then we have here a sequence of characters that we use to build the return address of the AMSI scan uh, buffer function. Why this, why this sequence or why this value, basically we'll see during our next slides because this value is not random, so it's not a random value, it's taken from somewhere, but we'll see during the, the next slide. And then, using the Marshall copy technique, we'll patch the address within the memory of the, of the AMC scan buffer function. Okay, so uh, we were talking about the, the value, and here is the, the explanation. Basically, 
if we take a look over the official documentation by, by Microsoft of the AMSYSCAN buffer function, you will see here at return value that, quote, if this function succeeds, it returns S underscore OK. Otherwise, it returns an H result error code. End of the code. Basically, what is missing here, and it's a very, very important uh, part of the documentation, is that Microsoft doesn't tell us that if the function returns H, H result error code, any scripts can be run. So any scripts can be executed on the workstation. And unfortunately, they forgot, uh, forgot to, um, to write this down on the documentation. So you uh, researchers have to, to figure it out um, about this one. And basically, you may assume now that the next step would be to What would be the, the next step here, basically? Sorry? Yes, basically to return an H result code. So we'll patch the AMSYSCAN buffer function to return an H, H result error code. And that value is an H result error code. And where we can find the H result error codes within uh, Microsoft documentation, basically they have also a documentation uh, page with the H result values. For example, this value uh, is basically invalid argument. So you can take any value and it's, it's official basically if we search H result values on, on Google. Let's see. Okay, it's loading. Do we have internet? Yes, we have internet. Okay, so all of those are age result codes that we can use to patch our AMSYSCAN buffer function. So anything from here would work. Okay, let me go back to the presentation. So we have this payload which is the AMC, um, the AMC bypass payload. But this is detectable. Do you know what we can add, what flavor we can add for this payload to make it more, uh, let's say, undetectable? Any ideas? It starts with O. Exactly, obfuscation. So we can obfuscate this partial code and it will look something like this. Uh, this is obfuscated using, using invoke obfuscation, which is the, the most well-known uh, obfuscation script for PowerShell scripts. And you can see it uses uh, normalized functions, uh, conversion to, um, to hexadecimals for characters, and then reconversion back to, um, to character arrays. And basically, where we cannot apply obfuscation, because that's a very important part, we can apply obfuscation on the PowerShell code, but we be very cautious when you apply obfuscation on the C-sharp code, because you uh, may trigger some errors if we apply too much obfuscation. So in this example, normalize over the C-sharp code will not work. So what uh, I tried here is just to change the, the variable names. So changing the variable's name to some random characters, but not nothing more. <clears throat> okay, so we have the, the AMC bypass uh, payload. Let's see what's next. Execution policy. How many of you run into this error? Okay, so uh, this error, uh, yeah, the light is a little bit yeah, too, too light. Um, so this is the execution policy, which tells us that you are not allowed to run this PowerShell script because it's not digitally signed, because running scripts is not allowed on the workstation because we are um, a non-administrator uh, user. So what we'll do in this case, 
basically microsoft uh, allows us to to set our own execution policy so for our own user to unrestricted we cannot as a non-administrator user we cannot change the global execution policy for all the users but we can change for our users which is pretty cool right we can we can basically bypass the execution policy for our user and allow us to run any PowerShell script. And once we we discussed with Microsoft about this, they their answer was the following: it's it's not a vulnerability, it's a feature. So, so yeah, so cool feature, right? And this is this is the whole this is the whole bypass. It's it's just just a single line. Nothing fancy, nothing complex, just just a single line. Yeah. Sorry if you expected something more complex for this part, but <laughs> that's it. It's just abuse of a feature. Um, and then we have the payload runner development. So let's see how we can put everything together in order to uh, to inject it within the within the memory. <coughs> so. Uh, we'll use also PowerShell for this purpose, and we have multiple uh, multiple functions here, including the the lookup function, which is basically used to search for some uh, assembly references within the within the memory. And uh, we'll not get into this uh, this function because it's pretty pretty complex and requires um, a lot of explanation. But it is used to search for assembly references within the memory. And then we have the get delegate type function, which is used uh, to um, basically to set the argument types. What it means? It means the following. Basically, PowerShell. We we are using here, as you've seen previously, we are using C sharp plus PowerShell. Some Windows API native functions doesn't know about uh, pointers, doesn't know about uh, int32. <coughs> so we need to to set all of them using the get delegate uh, type function, which basically is used to to pass all those uh, argument types to the Windows API native functions that we'll call later, including the create thread uh, function that we'll see we'll see later. And then uh, we need uh, a memory space within uh, within the the victim uh, workstation. And as you can see here, we have the virtual alloc function from the kernel 32.dll library. And we are uh, allocating here the, the memory space. And as you can see, we are using uh, an integer pointer, which PowerShell doesn't know about it. So we are using the get delegate type uh, function to set that integer pointer. For the for our function for the virtual alloc function, and we are allocating um, a number of uh, bytes within the memory that can fit our shell code. In this case, our shell code is over two thousand, <coughs> which means that we need uh, enough memory address memory space, and we are setting here three thousand. And as you can see, we are pretty lazy. We are not using something like Cobalt Strike or uh, Brute Rattle or something like that. We are using uh, Metasploit, which should be should be caught by any antivirus solutions in the in this world. And our payload is not even encrypted; is not even obfuscated. So we are generating a reverse a row reverse a TCP meterpreter shellcode. Which should be detectable by by any antivirus, right? It should be. And uh, then we we basically uh, define our shell code within within PowerShell, and using the same Marshall copy, we inject the shell code into the memory, and then uh, basically into the into the memory that we just uh, assigned space, and then. We execute it 
using the create thread function. And here, the same. We are using the get delegate type function in order to set the integer pointers and all argument types. Okay, that's that's fine. We we have a payload, AMC bypass, execution policy, plus payload run. <coughs> Sorry, a bit a bit ill because the the weather here. Uh, I expect it to be more uh, more warm. So, uh, how can we deploy this attack using the the little bit USB? So, uh, as you've seen, Bob policy uh, said that removable media storage are disallowed. So, what what happened? Why it was allowed? Do you know why? <coughs> Sorry. Exactly, it's a keyboard. It's it's basically a keyboard. It's not a USB. It's a keyboard. It's a keyboard and a mouse within a single little device. So how can we program things on it? Um, there are two ways. How many of you heard about rubber duckies? So you heard about rubber duckies and you didn't hear about bad USB? Okay, so uh, for those who don't know, basically bad USBs are half the price of a rubber ducky or, or less. So why it is very important to note this thing? Because uh, rubber duckies can be used, uh, because of their price, uh, can be used very specifically. So if you have a target, only a single target, a very specific target, you can deliver a rubber ducky to them. But if you have like a whole organization, you can buy a bunch of bad USBs and drop them everywhere on, on the organization uh, smoking place or within the, um, uh, within the parking lot. You can, you can use them as disposable. Uh, devices because they are very very cheap but I want to to do a sub note here because it's also very important to test them those uh, are usually bought from countries that I don't want to specify the name of but they usually come with a backdoor mine mines because I bought like nine or ten of them all of them had a reverse shell on them so once you buy them test them within uh, an isolated environment such as the sandbox or virtual machine in order to see what they are trying to do and then use the Arduino compiler to erase everything from uh, from them okay let's let's get back to the uh, to the principal part so we have two two types of uh, deployments or programming uh, types for, for this bad USB. We can use the DigiSpark scripts or we can use the Ducky scripts. Um, what is the difference between those two? Basically, the G DigiSpark or the Arduino uh, scripts can be can be used to, to directly compile, uh, to program, to directly program and compile C++ code on those devices. And, but if you are not very familiar or if you are not comfortable with C++, I'm not very comfortable with C++ and with all their libraries that are used to, uh, to build things into the bed USB, uh, we can use something like Ducky scripts. Ducky scripts are basically used for rubber duckies. <coughs> and they, they are very, 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 very simple to use. So they have a very simple syntax and we can use a script like Duckuino on, on Google, on GitHub, I think it's on GitHub, so it's open source, to, to convert from uh, Ducky script to, to bad USB script, and then just put everything in an Arduino compiler, and that's it. And when I say simple, it's that simple. So, uh, basically, this is the uh, rubber Ducky, or Ducky script uh, syntax, we have here the, the string and basically what we type after the string uh, command, it will be typed by our bad USB. So anything typed after the string will be typed by our bad USB. Then we have delays. We can use delays basically um, to, uh, 
when we assume that the target computer is very slow. Why? Because sometimes our bed USB can be faster than the target computer. So we need to put some delays between typing the commands in order to have the perfect flow of execution. Because uh, you can crash or you can, um, it, it happens for the BDSB to type very, very fast and the system to not receive all the keys that are typed by the, by the BDSB. Uh, then rem is a comment. Repeat, it's the it's a loop of the last command, and you can repeat that last command um, sometimes. Uh, repeat one, it will repeat one time. Repeat ten, it will repeat ten times. <coughs> and if you want to uh, to type like to press enter or tab or control. <coughs> or all the, the special keys from here, like shift, backspace, insert, delete, all of those must be typed uh, on, the, on the command line, on the script, uh, as they are written on the, on the keyboard. Guy is the Windows key, and with mouse underscore move, we control the coordinates where the pointer of the mouse can move. And L mouse, R mouse, M mouse stands for left mouse, air, uh, right mouse, and middle mouse are the buttons from our from our mouse that we want to to press by bed USB. And uh, some some tips after the exploitation after we gain initial access. Basically, if we have a metaprepter shell, what we can do we can migrate to another process such as explorer.exe. Pretty easy, basically, because we we have a uh, metaprepter, and you can you can migrate pretty pretty easy with that one. And uh, I think this is the most awaited moment. Basically, we'll have a live demo now. We'll use uh, an AWS infrastructure. <coughs> it seems that uh, I'm signed out, so. As a command and control, we'll use the AWS. Just one second, because it's it's loading. Until it loads, uh, how many of you deployed a successful attack using bed USB or rubber ducky? Okay, one. Anybody else? Two. Okay, two people. Okay. One second, I'm trying to log into AWS. Okay, it's loading. Yeah, so uh, our our demo will be the following. Uh, let's assume this this Windows machine is our victim. The victim plugs in the bed USB into the device. It has Windows Defender with real-time protection on, and uh, we have a command and control infrastructure hosted on AWS. So external uh, C2, C2 infrastructure. And it seems that it's loading. Let me see. Okay. Uh, and let me tell you until it loads. Uh, let me tell you about something else. Uh, have you seen that uh, there are some USBs? So not bad USBs, but uh, killer USBs. How many of you know about about them? Nice, nice, pretty. Pretty nice. Okay, basically those killer USBs just send some electric shocks into the into the devices, and it it fries out the the motherboard and all the internal stuff. Okay, we'll SSH into our C uh, two endpoint. Of course, using a private. 
he your Okay, it's loading. It's loading, loading, loading. Come on. Yeah. I think also the the internet is pretty pretty slow. Okay. Am I logged? Oh, uh, no, I'm logged here already. So uh, basically, let's no. <laughs> I I was logged out here. One second. Hope it will be faster a little bit. Um, yeah. Basically, when we want to um, to test the the bed USB payloads and we want to uh, to debug it, we can use something like Arduino I. Uh, Arduino compiler, which is used for all the Arduino boards, development boards. You can use it to uh, to write and compile code for um, for bed USB. Okay, here we will use the MSV console. It's a little slow. Console. Basically, the Metasploit framework for the purpose of this presentation, which should be should be detectable by by any antivirus uh, solutions. Okay, it is starting. We'll use the exploit multi handler. Uh, which is the which is the listener, and our payload will be for Windows. So set payload Windows uh, x64 meterpreter reverse underscore TCP. So here, very important to note, we'll use the same payload that we set up during the generate step of the of the shell code and set L host will be 0 .0 0.0.0.0 so we catch everything okay set listening port L port 443 something common and we start the listener okay we start the listener let's check antivirus Okay, um, pom, 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 pom. view security dashboard. And we have real time protection on. So, Windows Defender using real time protection on. We'll put this. Okay. And we have the, the bed USB, which will simulate the action that Bob Dad did. So, he inserted the bed USB. And let's let's see what happens. Okay, so this is the the AMC bypass uh, payload. Uh, basically, here is the get delegate type function. I've put it to run slowly in order to show you each function. Uh, we have here the shell code that we are injecting into the memory, but here it's just trying to um, to define it. And here, using the Marshall copy, uh, we injected the payload and we created the thread here. And let's check our, our listener. And we got a connection. It's Metapreter connection. Shell. And we got a shell. 
let's exit it. We got Metapreter and we got Windows Defender. Let's let's try something else that any antivirus should catch. Load Mimikatz. <laughs> yeah, I need to update my my uh, meta sprite, but just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Oh, it's not too visible. Seems so. Let me put it. And here we have Mimikets success. Yeah, so yeah. That's that's basically that's basically it. You you can have uh, initial access, so one interaction access within uh, within any any devices that are running, for example, Defender, or I have another thing uh, for you here. Um, after prevention, I have a little little statistics that we will discuss. So, um, how can we prevent against uh, those those attacks? Basically, PowerShell is one of the one of the main root causes. So let's let's just cut the problem from its root cause. Let's just disable PowerShell for the for the end users. Disable it without any feature allowed. So disable PowerShell, disable command line for end users. Uh, for physical part, uh, enforce uh, access control lists on the USB ports. Uh, also try to switch from an antivirus perspective to a more uh, advanced uh, endpoint detection, prevention, uh, protection uh, solutions like an ADR. Um, and also security awareness. Of course, all all security uh, tips says security awareness. So I should I should also put it here. Uh, train the users to not pick USB f USBs from the parking lot and insert into the corporate devices. Yeah, it, it should be. So this is not fictional. This scenario is not fictional. Bob, of course, the name is fictional. W was not Bob, was somebody else, but it was it was a real scenario. So it was a real scenario. It happens, and you have you have pretty pretty good success rate sometimes, especially especially if you have the the delivery methods um, very well put in place. For example, as a side note, uh, how many of you remember the? I think it was Best Buy phishing. Okay, let me show you then. Uh, I think it was Best Buy Fishing, Best Buy USB Fishing. Let me see. Yes, this one. This one was a real attack. Yeah, it's it's pretty loading. Basically, they used uh, Best Buy brand to deliver bad USBs to, to victims and said that your discount code is on this USB. And uh, it was some, some years ago, but it was pretty, pretty efficient right here. Uh, I can't see what it tells, but I remember that, yeah, if you get a Best Buy gift card on a USB drive in the mail, don't plug it into your PC, code by PC Mag. So it's it's real. Those those attacks are pretty, pretty real. Okay, uh, some research. Uh, basically, for the purpose of this presentation, Windows Defender was used in order to keep a uh, vendor or solution neutral. Um, basically, the issue was reported to, to Microsoft. They didn't consider it uh, as an issue. 
because they said you need physical access, you need s social engineering techniques. So it's not a high, um, it's not basically uh, a high impact issue, especially that we gave uh, real scenarios where basically our team was able to to infiltrate within organizations using this using this technique uh, but besides that the the next report uh, basically was using this technique so uh, the the next level you can guess you can assume what is the next level so microsoft didn't consider this an issue because of the delivery channel so let's switch a little bit of the deliveries channel and i can tell you that those payloads are working even within macros. So if we switch the delivery channel a little bit, um, they may consider it as an, as an issue. But the, the macros needs a little bit of escaping and a little uh, adjustments, but it, it works. You can get to, to a version that it works and you can have a silver bullet for, uh, for macros. <coughs> and uh, basically the bad USB scenario was tested on 20 antivirus vendors, uh, seven from 20 spawned a uh, metaprater reverse shell, uh, basically allowed us to load mimicets into the memory, nine from 20 spawned a normal, just a normal reverse shell, and four from 20 blocked the attempt at the add type uh, function. So uh, once they detected the add type, a function within the PowerShell, they blocked the the attempt. Uh, and I think that's it. Thank you, thank you very much for your attention. Now, if you have some some questions or curiosities, yes, please. Forgive my ignorance, but um, when you when you demo <coughs> the USB type in the payload, it's very very fast, and you said you slowed it down. Could there not be an antivirus system in place where it detects on, on, on speed, input speeds that are, are impossible for <laughs> humans? And wouldn't that stop the bad USB if they could say, okay, all this is being typed out super, super fast. A, a human cannot write this fast, there's no typos, let's block it. Can it not, can it not be developed or is it developed? That's a very nice idea. I, I'm not aware about something like this one. But you can propose that one to, to some antivirus vendors because it's a very cool idea and it can stop the, the bad USB scenarios. So it would stop them all, it, it wouldn't matter the payload, it would, just, it would detect it before it even can react with anything because this is impossible, a human cannot write this, block it straight away. Exactly. But if they copy paste it, mm. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, or or simulate a human. <laughs> yes. Um, is there a existing like, methodology for batching speed? Because it looks quite obvious when it's happening. <coughs> uh, even if you weren't able to establish a plug-in in USB and some and it, you know, code is scrolling down your screen, is there a way to hide that? Uh, yes, for example, you can remove the sleep command and it will be like this, like in a second. It will be in a, not even in a second, in like millisecond. So it will be lightning fast. You you cannot observe it. And also, for example, if the the target uh, has a policy in place that says, okay, there uh, the devices will be locked out uh, after <coughs> after some minutes. You can uh, try to use the bed USB to unlock the the Windows screen. So it is also possible. Yes, please. Actually, none. I use Linux. I'm a Kali Linux. <laughs> you see, I have also Kali Linux status. So <laughs> yes. Any anything else? Off, off subject, but do you see like the more people when Linux becomes more popular, there are going to be more targeted viruses and malware payloads that are targeted for Linux, and and would there be like a Uh, 
usually people that uses Linux cannot be caught very easily in a phishing attempt or to run some uh, malware on their workstations. So usually people that are running Windows are more non-technical while people that are running Linux, this is from an attacker perspective. So if I was a hacker, normally I would target Windows uh, workstations because those are being used by non-technical people and what I want to target, financial, HR, marketing, things of the nature where they they have loads of work and they ignore the some security best practices. While Linux users, they see, oh, it's a, it's an elf executable or it's something, something nasty here. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, yes, I, I have actually, uh, an article, but it's basically the talk is based on an article. Uh, I don't remember if I have it also on my GitHub, but it's on my, in, in my medium article. This, this one. Any, any other question? Yes. <laughs> what? What popped up? Ah, oh, ah, 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 okay, I, I thought, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, and here we didn't do the, uh, the post exploitation, but here you see the, the shell is still active, so it didn't catch, it didn't cut the connection after some time, it can stay there for days, hours, months, so it's pretty, it's pretty persistent. And we didn't do any migrate to another process. We have Mimikes there, we have the Metapreter there. And we were talking about five, ten minutes and it's still there. So. Sorry? Uh, no, it doesn't have that persistence. It's just a process. It's a thread, actually. It's, it's a thread. So, any other questions? Or we can discuss after the presentation. We may have a chat. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>